Welcome to our MJA podcast, the series, Children Who Never Made It Home, Episode 7, Part 1. My name is Mark Harper, and I am your host for tonight's podcast. I am the lead investigator and one of the founding partners at MJA. Case 1, Carrie Ann Newmaker, 16 years of age, disappeared from Elkhart, Indiana on January 28, 1991. She was last seen alive coming home from the YMCA where she and a friend watched some male classmates of theirs play basketball. Carrie's friend got another ride home and Carrie took one boy in her car when she left the YMCA. She dropped him off at the McDonald's restaurant. She was new to the town and unfamiliar with the area. Two days later, Carrie's maroon 1982 Chevy Cavalier was found parked in an alley off of Morton Street in Elkhart. On February 5th, 19, on February 5th, her frozen body was found off a county road 131 near Bonneville Mill Park. She had been raped and strangled. Fred Mott, a rapist, is also a suspect. He was in the area at the time Carrie vanished, and it appears she fits his victim profile. Mott has a long history of violent sexual assaults against women, including multiple convictions in Illinois and one in Elkhart County. It just so happened I interviewed Fred Mott several times in 1987 when he was in the prison system in Indiana. Case 2. Kathleen Marie Flynn, 11 years old. On September 23, 1986, the 11-year-old disappeared from Norwalk, Connecticut. She was last seen walking home from Panawas Ridge Middle School in Norwalk. The journey was about a half a mile on a paved path through the woods. Kathleen Marie Flynn's body was found at 3.30 a.m. the next day. She was only a few hundred feet from the school's athletic fields. The 11-year-old had been raped and strangled. Police have a suspect who is currently in prison for unrelated crimes, but they have never had enough evidence to charge him. Case 3. Christina Marie Wesselman, nicknamed Christy. The high school sophomore disappeared on July 21, 1985 from her hometown of Glen Lynn, a suburb of Chicago, Illinois. On July 21, 1985, Christina Marie Wesselman left her house to go to a jewel food store on Routes 56 and 53 in the Valley View subdivision. She purchased some candy and soda and then began walking home but never made it. Christina Marie Wesselman's body was found the next day hidden in the tall grass along her route home. She had been raped and stabbed eight times. Case 4. Peggy Sue Altiz, 11 years old, disappeared on November 12, 1984 from her home on the east side of Indianapolis, Indiana. 11-year-old Altee's body was found five days later in a field in Hancock County, Indiana. Peggy Sue Altee's had been raped and stabbed several times. Peggy Sue's brother-in-law, Jerry Watkins, was convicted of her murder in 1986. Watkins had admitted to molesting her before her murder, but he denied abducting and killing her. 
In 2000, Watkins was freed after DNA testing proved that semen found on Peggy Sue's body was not his. Police arrested five suspects in the next four years and had to let every one of them go. One of them was Joseph McCormick, admitted molesting Peggy Sue Altis before her death and was sentenced to six years for that crime, but DNA testing proved he was not the killer. Case 5 Barbara Rowan, 14 years old. On August 3, 1984, the 14 year old disappeared from Ben Salem Township, Pennsylvania. The 14 year old Rowan was last seen alive when she left her home in Ben Salem Township. Barbara Rowan told her father she was going to visit a friend who lived nearby. She never arrived at the friend's house. On August 16, 1984, Barbara Rowan's body was found hidden in some weeds about a quarter of a mile from her home. She had been bound and gagged and was naked, but her clothes was found nearby. Case 6 Kathleen Mary Combe, 11 years old, nicknamed Kathy. 11-year-old Kathleen Combe disappeared on April 5, 1981 when she left her home in Santa Claus, Indiana to go for a jog and she never returned. The 11 year old the 11, the 11 year old enjoyed basketball, roller skating, swimming and running soccer and her pet cat. The body of Kathleen Combe was not found for 10 weeks. On June 11, 1981, the 11-year-old female victim's body was located in a woods a mile from her home. Kathy Combe had been raped and shot in the head, and her underpants were stuffed in her pocket. Her parents believe they know who killed her. A civil jury found Stanton Gash liable for Kathy's wrongful death and awarded her parents $5,000. Case 7. In memory of Carrie Ann Madeline. Carrie Ann Madeline, 8 years old, from Greenfield, Tennessee, on September 1, 1979, was going to ride her bike with her brother, Michael, who was 6 years old. Robert Glenn Coe saw the children and stopped his car and conned Carrie Ann into the car and then kidnapped and raped and murdered her. Her brother was found standing on the side of the road at the perimeter Baptist Church holding both bikes. Rescue workers found Carrie Ann's body in a field 10 miles west of her weekly County home 20 hours later. She had been raped and stabbed. Police arrested Robert Glenn Co. 23 of McKenzie at the Greyhound gas station in Huntington three days after the killing. Co., a part time auto mechanic with a history of sexual deviancy and drug abuse, had dyed his sandy brown hair black and sold his Ford Grand Torino. He was preparing to board a bus for Georgia. MJA has added 24 missing children from 1960s to 1970s to our missing persons and children who never made it home. Starting with the children who never made it home, go to 1 to 23. Could there be a serial killer concerning some of these cases? We would like to thank Martha Hamilton who sent us some of this info on these missing children. She found them while researching for her missing sister. Some of these cases MJA never knew about. So these victims are not forgotten. We posted them on our site. There are photos in our photo gallery under MJA Inc. Investigation Case Photos. We are taking a pause for the cause. 
And when we return, we have a guest on tonight's podcast, Dan. We will be back in a moment with Dan's interview. Coming soon to our MJA podcast, The Death of Marcus Merritt Sr. Due to the aggressive efforts of the national groups Together We Stand out of California and MJA Inc. Investigations out of Indiana and New York and another research group with the key being Royce, the victim's mother, who lit the fire during the investigation. During, early on during our investigation, we gained visual and audio evidence that there was a cover-up concerning the death of Marcus Merritt Sr. We turned up the heat to where we did a national live radio blog broadcast on May 25, 2016. On June 2, 2016, they exhumed Mr. Merritt's body. Some six months later, in December, the Louisiana State Police issued a 26 page report on the autopsy and the death investigation concerning Mr. Merritt's death. During reading the 26-page report, you will see on the pages that it will state, please see attachments. There was no attachments, there were no photos, there was no toxicology report. Once again, the state of, of Louisiana is covering up the true facts of Marcus Merritt Sr.'s death. We were guaranteed the full report after the death investigation was completed. We will be doing a podcast very soon concerning these matters. Guests on the podcast will be the founder and president of the national group Together We Stand and the victim's mother, Royce, with two members of our staff. Now back to our MJA podcast. MJA covers a lot of cases on our podcast and some you have may have never heard of and our podcast is to educate the public with that being said welcome Dan to our MJ podcast episode 7 and it's titled children who never made it home and this is part one and how are you doing tonight Dan I'm doing just great Mark how are you I'm just fine and when you read the news, do you have a feeling that it is open hunting season of our children? The way the media works, absolutely. You know how they like to lead with them child abduction stories because they grab hard news headlines. So every day when you turn on the TV, it seems like you're not going too long without it hearing about a missing child, which I guess is good because even without the news, children still go missing every few seconds in this country. So the more media attention we can get for them, the quicker we can get for them is probably for the best. And do you think as a country we have failed to protect our children? I don't know about that. Everybody does the best they can. Obviously, I don't think they want bad things to happen to their kids. You can't obviously be with your children every second of every day. I couldn't imagine a world where we do much better. Obviously, the better technology gets, hopefully the less children will go missing. And as we learn more about, you know, the process of missing children investigations, 
more parents will hopefully learn what to look for in order to prevent and then how to deal with these situations once they occur. And how do you feel when you read about a child molester being caught and he happens to be a repeat offender? It's just disgusting. I mean, you read about these type of things, you know, and you just wonder what's wrong with the criminal justice system. You constantly hear about how prisons are making cuts, so they have to release violent offenders who supposedly serve their time in the community. He, but they're not out of beds now, so they have to be released back into the mainstream public. And I'm just wondering, how does the government intend to stop these people from molesting children? Because they're obviously monitored, but anyone like you or I that's ever done any type of work with sex offenders knows that it's hard to near impossible for them to ever change that psychological mindset that causes them to harm children. And do you understand that some states, they have a law that if you molest a child under 14 years of age, their sentence is life without the chance of parole. Do you think all of our states should adopt the same law? That's a great question, Mark, especially for me. I had a very good friend who I used to work with. Uh, she was my assistant and um, when I was taking my criminal justice courses, and her ex-husband uh, molested a child, and he was sentenced to 35 years he was 13, and she really wanted him to have gotten life. And I think you would get life when you commit a crime like that, because it's just unspeakable. There's no reason, like, you'll hear a lot of these pedophiles when they're talking to 11-year-olds saying, well, I thought she was 17, and you know there's no way they could have mistaken that 12-year-old for a 16, 17-year-old girl. But they give you that line anyway because they think they'll get away with it. Yeah. It's just disgusting and just hurting. And when you do stuff like that, you should be put away for life. And, and that's my opinion. And would it surprise you to hear that in some states, if you kill a child, you serve less time than you had if you had killed a, an adult? That might not necessarily surprise me. You know, the criminal justice system in this state, it's effed up, for lack of a better term. Two people could commit the exact same crime in the exact same area and get two different sentences. So you never know in this country how it's going to shake out. It depends on a variety of factors, I guess, and every case is different. But I would assume that maybe the reason they get a harsher punishment or a more swift punishment for murdering an adult is because maybe it requires a higher standard of proof to prove that they murdered a child beyond reasonable doubt. I couldn't tell you. Okay. But that's a large part of the problem that we have with the criminal justice system in this country is that two people will commit the crime, the same crime in the exact same area with the exact same judges and get two different sentences. You know, you just can never make heads or tails of how it works. And we live in a world of high tech, so why doesn't the government have a program that has locator chips to locate our children? They're getting to that. Obviously, you see they want to put more and more tracking technology in the cell phones, and the iPads, these kids, so they could be gps all the time. And obviously, you know, with most kids, they're going to have their iPad or their cell phone with them mostly all the time. So for the most part, they are tracked. But when it comes to putting a chip inside of people, most people might not know that under Obamacare, NC-217, they wanted to put chips that were similar to that inside of people. The problem arises that when people try to do that, 
because of long-standing religious held beliefs about, you know, the end of the world and the mark of the beast. They worry about when the government puts those chips inside of people and starts tracking them that way, what effect that will trickle down onto the rest of society if the government's able to track you everywhere you are. But with the rise in violent crime, it wouldn't surprise me that one day if a crime bad enough happened to where we actually started GPSing little kids to prevent them from going to missing. And uh, once again, as you mentioned, yes, there are c cell phones that keep track of our children, but it's not a fail-proof system because sometimes the child leaves the cell phone somewhere else. And I feel like we need something that is a fail-safe system. And with that being said, okay, it's not going to stop a monster from taking any children, but my experience has taught me these animals are not wired right, and sometimes it's a never-ending hunger, and many times if they want a certain child, they start hatching a plan. Dan, in your eyes, is it more disturbing to you when you find out the offender stalked the victim? Yes, because that requires a deal of pre-planning. And unlike a crime that happens spontaneously, when you see a pedophile stalk a child, you really get a deeper glimpse into their reality, you know, how they feel a sexual attraction or an obsession towards the child. And it's just, it's hard for you to wrap your head around because obviously you and I have normal sexual attractions, so we'll never understand what it's like to be attracted to children. And honestly, I never would. It's something I discussed, you know, with many people over the years. And it's just because it's not something that, you know, I'm not physically attracted to children. It's just not something I can understand. And, Dan, in your opinion, what type of person becomes an offender murdering children? Well, there could be a variety of factors. Extreme abuse, obviously, is one. Arthur Shawcross was a great example. His mother abused locked him in a basement, made him dress in girls' clothes, abused him, humiliated him, and that'll drive you to thinking, you know, that's the way that children are supposed to be treated. So a lot of times it's a process learned early on in your life, you know, that the value of children isn't that much. I know in other countries, unlike the United States, and you've been to a lot of these places, you could buy children for a couple of dollars. You know, so, and a lot of people say that, you know, with drugs and guns, the new currency for a lot of places in the United States with all these pedophiles is children. They're basically used as currency now. And do you think some people can kill just one child and then just stop? Some people maybe, because maybe they don't want to kill a child in the first, first place, but if they have a long-standing sexual psychology to do that, then it's going to occur again. Well, I remember when I first saw the website, Children Who Never Made It Home, it just blew me away, and it, it was a shame that the website became inactive. So MJA copied as many files as we could to keep these cases alive. So, Dan, these seven cases we just displayed, was it a shock because of the years of these crimes when they took place? Yeah, some of them have occurred more recently. Like I said before, in the age of modern technology and DNA and social media, it's hard to believe that anybody could go missing in the modern society and just disappear. And obviously, I would have to think it's probably because something bad 
and the, because they're obviously not going to be gone completely if they just went missing. Whereas if they're dead, they're going to stay off the grid permanently. And Dan, with the advances in DNA, these these crimes that took place years ago, any items of evidence they might have could be retested. Is that correct? Depending on what the item is and how it was stored, it's possible. Now, if the items were collected correctly when the crime happened or the evidence wasn't preserved in the right manner, then it won't be tested. But as long as it was both collected and preserved in the right manner, and everybody knows that for different pieces of evidence, there are obviously different, you know, procedures you go about for storing them. As long as that's done, it's vehemently possible to get a DNA sample for a lot of these old cases. The only problem that seems to occur is it takes a while. Because when you put in a request to these bigger state labs, and even with the FBI, they just get such a volume of requests that it takes a while for them to process every one that they have to go through. And let me throw a number at you. In our files, we have 127 unsolved child murders, and we've been told by some experts that at least 17 to 20 percent of these victims could be a ser serial killer with no boundaries. Does that sound sane or insane to you? It's possible and insane. Anything could happen to these missing children or people that go missing. We discussed in the Elizabeth Ann Hill case everything that could have possibly happened to her after her abduction. And one thing that I found in my research is I was, you know, researching the gypsies, which is the group of people that we believe took her, is that one of the reasons they're so concerned about these children is because when they're abducted into a group like that and are forced to commit criminal acts to get money and things that they need for basic everyday living, is that there's a great fear by law enforcement that being around that type of behavior will turn them into common criminals when they're of age. So if you've been exposed to crime like that your whole life, it's not hard to take to it like a duck to water. You've obviously heard the research, you know, that a lot of kids who are sexually abused themselves go on to sexually abuse children and even murder it's just a cycle that keeps repeating for as long as it goes on until somebody breaks it. And not long ago, two Jane Does were found miles apart, and they had the same type of DNA match. But how that match came about, they have kept quiet. What do you think the odds are in that happening? having two Jane Doe's apart with a similar DNA match. Did they say it was their DNA or the DNA of an offender? No, their, their like, DNA. Like they were related? Yes. But see, they haven't come out and said how they are related. But what I'm asking you is, just being a few miles apart, Okay, what do you think the odds are in that happening? I'm not a mathematician, but I would at least say probably, what, a couple of million to one. Okay. Thanks, Dan, for being on the podcast. We look forward to hearing from you in uh, part two of this series. That's the end of tonight's podcast in our series, Children who never made it home. MJA Inc. Investigations covers a lot of cases on our MJA podcast. We are trying to help to educate the public. The more people you reach can bring in leads or other resources to help the case. At this time, 
MJA has 44 staff members working on 90 cases covering 12 states, and that's not including the dozens of cases where we act as consultants because we don't travel to those areas at this time. MJA plans on adding three more cases to our case files by the end of the year. MJA is always looking for resources that can help our cases. Coming to you soon from the MJA podcast, episode 10, part 1, Murdered Couples, episode 12, part 1, The Reiner Killings, episode 13, part 1, The Wonderland Murders, episode 14, part 1, Patty Hearst and the SLA. I have two quotes for you listeners. Life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. Charles Swindle. There are two great days in a person's life. The day we are born and the day we discovered why. William Barclay. Always remember folks If you ever get bored and don't know what to do, take a hike deep in the woods. You might be surprised what you might find. Thanks to all of you listeners, and good night from Plattsburgh, New York.